Good evening, my brothers and sisters. It's good to see each of you today. For some of you, it may be good morning, maybe seeing each at a different time. But we're delighted you joined us for Bible study. Let's open up a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for your grace and your mercy to us. We thank you for your love and kindness and all that you do for us day by day. And God, during this uh, challenging and changing season, we pray, Lord, to help us uh, to grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Now, Lord, bless us as we look into the perfect law of liberty, knowing there, Lord, in your word, uh, if we listen to what you're saying, it's going to change who we are to who you want us to become. We thank you now. We honor you now in Christ's name. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we have entered a new month. Uh, we've entered the month of April which often is a month that we celebrate Easter, Palm Sunday, Passion Week, and all those wonderful things. Um, this month, our emphasis uh, at the church is uh, church family warfare. If we were uh, having our normal Bible study, when I say normal, I mean with uh, the congregation here, this is a Wednesday that we would uh, shared testimonies. Uh, it's our tradition uh, that the Wednesday before uh, the first Sunday that we would share testimony. And since we don't have a congregation as such tonight, I just want to say that I'm grateful tonight. I'm grateful today just to be here uh, in the midst of this very trying time, this pandemic in our nation, yea, in the world, and certainly has impacted our state and our community here in Sumter, um, God has been good to us. God has provided for us and he's kept us. And I, I am grateful to the Lord for his many blessings. And so I want to encourage you tonight to, or uh, whatever you are, might view this Bible study, I want to encourage you to take time for some praise and some thanksgiving, just remembering what God has done for you. Uh, it may be something in this day and age as simple as providing some water for you or providing your next meal or whatever it might be. So take some time um, to thank the Lord uh, for what he has done because we overcome the enemy by the word of our testimony. Our scripture passage, our focus scriptures for tonight are John chapter 19, 25 through 27. But I would like to read again at verse number 16 in the 19th chapter of the book of St. John. I want to put these verses, uh, our emphasis verses, in context. Uh, it says in verse 16 that finally Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. The crucifixion of Jesus, so the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. They crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that it might, uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, 
they divided my clothes among themselves and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clovis, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there, and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, the, this disciple took her into his home. Those are the words, this is the word of the Lord for us for this evening as we look at this particular text. Again, as I said, we're entering a new month. Um, we are looking at a new um, focus theme, which is uh, church family warfare. Our thought for the month is kingdom citizens engaged in church family warfare strive to build healthy relationships by following Jesus' example of surrendering his life so that others could live and feel the presence of peace in our world of chaos. We have three questions to consider tonight. Um, number one, are you a, a person who only thinks of yourself? Ponder that for a minute. Are you a person who only thinks of yourself? The second question says, how important is family to you? Uh, this also includes your church family. We often sing the song, I need you, you need me. Uh, the reality is, my brother, it is true, it's more than a song. We all need one another. The third person asked, do you know that the family was the first institution that God created? And that's very important for us to remember because in essence, we often put many other things before the family, but the family is the first institution that God created. Um, I've said this often and it's worth repeating again tonight. Um, strong families make strong churches. It is not strong churches that make strong families. The family comes before uh, the church. Long before we ever heard the concept of church uh, or the, uh, the ecclesia, the, the, the called out one, the gathered ones, we, there was family. Let's look at the, the, the lesson, at the heart of the lesson, uh, a conversation about family from the cross or a cross perspective. In the introduction, John, the writer of this book, is giving a detailed and informative account of Jesus' final moment on the cross. John has a renewed perspective because of the cross. In fact, what John uh, rejected from other evangelists, he now is placing great uh, interest and emphasis on uh, as he witnessed to the life and ministry of Christ. There were seven important conversations um, or last sayings that Jesus had on the cross. In this lesson, we will look at the third saying, which was Jesus showing concern and care for his family, particularly for his mother. Since we're coming up to Palm Sunday and we'll soon be into Holy Week, I thought it was worth mentioning those seven sayings from the cross. And we may repeat them again next week, but let me just go ahead and mention them um, briefly. Uh, the first one, he says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Luke 23, 34. Number two, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 43. Number three, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then he said to the disciple, This is your mother. John 19, 26 and 27. 
Number four, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46, and Mark 15, 34. Number five, I thirst, John 19, 28. Number six, when Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and handed over the spirit, John 19, 30. And number seven, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit, Luke 23, 46. As we continue our lesson tonight, I want to remind you that as Christians, we are always involved in spiritual warfare. No matter who we are or what we're doing in the church, no matter what our position is, we, we are involved in spiritual warfare. And just as there are challenges in our families, there are challenges in the church and in the family of God and in the body of Christ. Our first outline today reminds us that kingdom citizens simply must know this, care for your family. Again, the verse, uh, verse 25 in John 19 says, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clovis and Mary Magdalene. Jesus was sending a powerful message uh, that family matters, family counts, family remains or means something. Jesus sees Mary standing there. He cares for her and does what he can for her, uh, except take away her pain. I thought it was an interesting clause there. He cannot take away her pain. Even, or he does not take away her pain, even at the point of death, he was living out the fifth commandment, which simply says, honor your father and your mother. Exodus 20, 12. Remember, uh, this whole cross perspective is that Jesus is preparing uh, to die to atone man, uh, for mankind's sin, which is actually the beginning of the family, which is now known as the body of Christ or the church. Can I just remind you as I remind myself that every family experiences pain. It is interesting that Jesus secures Mary's salvation, but he doesn't take away her pain. Every family experiences pain. As you walk, as you and I walk through our current situations, whatever that might be, know that you and I are not alone, and that we are not the only ones that are going through this situation. Some of you may have had an occasion today to go to the doctor. And more often than not, if you did go to the doctor today or this week, then you notice that you are not the only one in the waiting room. You are not the only one there who needed a prescription refill. Or you're not the only one that needed an x-ray or a CAT scan or whatever else you might have needed. You are not the only one. In this life, we will all experience pain. And even the mother of Jesus experienced pain. My brothers and sisters, um, one of the things that we need to remind ourselves of is that many of us have neglected our families. We've neglected them for work. We've, we have neglected them for social commitments and for church obligations. Now, none of those things in and of themselves are bad. But when they take the place of things that should come first, then there is a priority issue on the table. Every family is impacted by sin. In the best families, sin mars our ability to get along at times. In the wealthiest families, sin leads brothers to steal from sisters. 
Jesus died that we might have new families. And I'm so glad about that today. Because of what Christ has done for us and what he did for us on the cross, we can have new family. The family is nothing new uh, to Jesus because uh, it was the first institution that God created. Sin did not cancel the family. Somebody ought to say amen. It, mer it merely separated us from God. You can see uh, that family is so important to God because he sacrificed his only son to put the family back together again. Kingdom citizens need to know that no matter how bad it gets, how dark life becomes, uh, and how lonesome uh, it can be at times, it's good to know that there are those in the family who have your back. Again, every family is impacted by sin. Jesus did not commit sin, but he died for sin. And because he died for sin, he was able to save his family and all the families that would turn to him. Are you caring for your family? Are you taking care of your family? And one of the things I've learned is that uh, in life, our families need different things. And we need to learn what it means to care. I need to learn what it means to care for my family, as you need to learn what it means to care for your family. Because no matter what we do, this family is the one that God has placed us in. Again, I ask you, are you caring for your family? Our friend and our director at the Family Life Center um, often asks, often makes a statement. He said, he said for a long time, he continues to say it, even to this day. He said, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. Um, I'm sure there's probably one or two of you out there that if you could have chosen a family to be born into, it wouldn't have been this one. You would have chosen a different one. But you didn't choose your family. I didn't choose my family. But I believe that we are divinely placed in our families. God has an eternal purpose in mind for the families that we were born into. The good, the bad, and the ugly. God has a divine purpose for us in our families. And so we need to care for our families. That's very important. Uh, and by the way, you already know this, but let me just say it again. You and I are not going to get another family. We got the one that we have, and we got to do the best we can with what we have. Again, are you caring for your family? The second outline says, kingdom citizens must know this. Care for your spiritual family. We just spoke of the biological family. Now we want to look for a minute at the spiritual family. Uh, by the way, I believe that just as God placed us in a certain biological family, I believe that God also places us in a certain spiritual family. Now, just like in the biological family, family members don't always get along. I know in my family we don't always get along. Uh, I'm the youngest of eight children, and you know we, we don't always get along. But, but not getting along or disagreeing about certain things doesn't change the fact that we love each other. And our love for one another in our biological families should supersede any differences that we have between us. Yes, we're going to have those families that are takers and users. Family members. Yes, we're going to have family members that are always looking for what they can get out of you without bringing anything to the table. And yet, they're still family. But we must be concerned about our family. We must care for our family. In our second outline, we want to focus, we want to shift a little bit and go to our uh, care for our spiritual family. And how many of you tonight are grateful for your spiritual family? I know I am. I love 
the family of God that he's made me a part of. And so I am grateful tonight for my spiritual family, my brothers and sisters who love me and care for me and who uh, who chastise me at times and who uh, encourage me at other times and who pray for me. Uh, those are some things that we ought to be doing for one another. John, John uh, 19, 26 says, uh, Jesus, NIV version, saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. He said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. From that moment, the, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Uh, may I just note that for those of you that know this or remember this, uh, that John was called the beloved disciple. Uh, he and Jesus had a very special relationship. And, it, and I believe it was because of this special relationship that uh, Jesus placed his mother in John's care. He entrusted his mother to John. Uh, this leads us to believe that John uh, had already demonstrated a genuine love for Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. I said Mary, who is the mother of Jesus here, because if you remember just a few minutes ago, we read in that verse, uh, it's, there were three Marys. There was Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus. There was Mary, the wife of Cleo, and there was Mary Magdalene. So this is, Jesus is putting um, Mary, his mother, into John's care. And that's very, very, very powerful. Can you be entrusted to take care of someone else? Uh, John knew that Jesus uh, was master, teacher, rabbi, Lord, and he himself was a student, a pupil, a follower, and an obedient servant. When Jesus said to John, care for this woman. He did not blink an eye. Wow, that's very powerful. He did not blink an eye. He took her in from that day forward. When Jesus called the disciples to follow him, he also called them to become a part of a group um, with a nucleus of 12, then of 120, and then of 3,000, and 5,000, and beyond even till today. When we become a believer, or when you become a believer, you don't just join uh, your life to Christ. You also join your life to Christ's family and to the family of God. The Bible tells us that the church is the bride of Christ. Someone once said that as a Christian, if you have a problem with the church, you're really saying, I love Jesus, I just hate his wife or I hate his children. Kingdom citizens know that you can't have Jesus without having the church. That's a good place to say amen. We are all family. I guess I have another question for you. Who are some of the spiritual mothers and fathers God has called you to care for? And are you willing to accept the challenge of caring for someone who doesn't have the same bloodline that you have, but to have the same salvation that you have? Someone has well said, biology does not make um, you automatically love someone. Love comes from the heart. And we know this to be true because we know that there are mothers who have given birth to children but don't love them. That's kind of harsh, but it's very real. I think of, of several years ago, I don't know that Susan Smith didn't love her children, but I know that she did drive them into a lake. And their other mothers have done horrible things um, to their children. So, so love doesn't come just from biology. Yeah, we all love our brothers and sisters that were born, uh, came from our mothers and fathers, but we all love our brothers and sisters that came through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's a new family. Uh, we're, 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 we're all a part of that family. And when we love other believers, 
uh, as God loves us, then that makes us a new family. And in the new family, well, you might have been born African American, but in the in the new family of God, there are some Caucasians, there are some Hispanics, there are some Asians, there are some uh, Europeans, there are some uh, Africans, there are some South Americans, whatever. They are part of that new family. So we make we make up one body in Christ, not because of blood in terms of the natural sense, but because of blood in terms of the spiritual sense. We love comes from the heart. With the coronavirus uh, in full swing, we cannot visit one another as much as we would like to. But we can call. We can text, we can email, we can find other ways to encourage others in the faith. How are you reaching out during these days? And uh, it's interesting that we have uh, this new phrase in our, uh, our, our, our conversation now called social distancing. And for a person like me who loves to hug and love to be hugged, that's very difficult. And yet, um, we can find ways to reach out to people and give them a spiritual hug or an emotional hug by doing showing kindness to them. Don't let this opportunity to pass you by. People still need to feel connected. You know, for many of us, coming to the church house um, has been our connection with one another. And now for many churches, we have not come to the church house in several Sundays now. And yet, we must work hard not to lose our connection with one another. We must make sure that we are calling, we make sure that we are reaching out, we need to make sure that we are doing what we can do to keep those connections going. Because in a time like this, we need the family of God to support us and to encourage us to lift us up and to pray for us. What are you doing to reach out? You can also, I challenge you to write an encouraging note. Some of you might even consider sending out Easter cards this year. Uh, or even cards that simply say, I'm thinking of you. When was the last time you wrote a note by hand? Not typed it, not faxed it, but you wrote a note by hand to someone. You might want to try that as a novel idea during these days because the family of God is starting to be connected during this crisis. Because one of the things that we've always rejoiced in as we've come together is that when we come together, there is a sense of unity and there's a sense of a spirit of worship and there's a spirit of praise and there's a spirit of, of, of thanksgiving and, and yet we've not been able to do that in the largest sense, but we can still do that uh, in a smaller group. Uh, we can do that through a Skype and we can do that through phone calls or FaceTime or whatever else. So take advantage of this time that we have to reach our Christian family. People still need to know that we can. Make a, an intentional, make a concerted effort to make sure that you're doing something to reach out to your spiritual family during these days. And our final uh, outline today simply says, kingdom citizens must know this, value others above yourself. Value others above yourself. We see here that Jesus, without question, is the apparent, uh, constant, ultimate servant. He stressed to his disciple, uh, disciples on many occasions that I did not come to be served, but to serve. My brothers and sisters, is that your testimony? That your focus is not what can people do for me, but what can I do to help somebody else? Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Who are you giving your life for? Or are you just trying to get by? He's trying to live. He's trying to duck the virus. 
Uh, we need to put others above ourselves. Is there someone that needs your help that you can give today? Then do it. Is there someone that needs your listening ear? Then give it. Is there someone that needs your prayer support? Then don't withhold it. A true servant uh, is not selfish or conceited. He or she places the needs of others above himself or herself. Look at Jesus. He's on the cross, beaten, scorned, ridiculed, facing a horrible death. And the list goes on. But he still cares for others uh, that are around him. He cares for others more than for himself. The reality is, we can, we can make a difference in the lives of others, but it's going to cost us something. Jesus saw, verse 27 says, Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her. Isn't that interesting? That he didn't have to look for John and say, well, has anybody seen John? I need to talk to him. He said, it says here that he, that John was standing near Mary. And he said to his mother, woman, this, here is your son. Then to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. And the scripture says, from that moment, the disciple accepted her as his own mother. Jesus was not focused on his pain. Wow nor his circumstance. I need to read that one again. Jesus was not focused on his pain, nor his circumstance. He was making sure that his mother was going to be taken care of. It was not just by anybody, but by someone he trusted to care for her as if uh, she was his own mother. This doesn't mean not to care for yourself. And for many of you that have flown, you know the same. When you get on the airplane, it says, in case of an emergency, you are instructed to put your own oxygen mask on first, then tend to others. Kingdom citizens, you are no good to others if you don't take care of yourself. Value others above yourself. It is interesting that uh, Jesus had biological siblings, but he entrusted his mother to John. Have you ever thought about that? He had biological siblings, but he entrusted his mother to John. There are times God will give us friends, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, with whom we possess a stronger bond than our biological family. Biological families are earthbound. Spiritual families are forever. So I just about wear a quick review. Kingdom citizens simply must know this. You must care for your family. Kingdom citizens must know this. Care for your spiritual family. And kingdom citizens must know this. Value others above yourself. When we put God first, and we put others next, and then ourselves, that means we're going to have a lot of joy in our lives. So I want to encourage you this week, the warfare is still on, and we see you coming close to the house of God. But I want you to know that God is doing a great work in our day. I want you to know that God is not asleep. God is not anemic. God is not in, in, God is, has not been moved or dethroned. He's still God in heaven above and on the earth below. And as we go through, as we battle, as we struggle, keep on leaning on the word of God, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Let's pray together. For this and all your blessings, Lord, we simply say thank you. For grace and mercy, God, we say thank you. For keeping, 
protecting and providing for us. God, we say thank you for redemption, for salvation, for the forgiveness of sin. Lord, we say thank you. We love you, praise, honor, and adore you, for you are worthy to be praised. And we thank you for dying our sin, for allowing them to bury you in a bar or two. And we thank you for rising early on the first day of the week, that Easter morning, for our redemption. In Christ's name, amen.